So, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here speaking to you as a rebel, as a mother, and more than anything, as a lover of life on Earth. I'm a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion. We decided to do this thing in my house in April last year. Uh, but many of the things I say today are personal views. There was something about the situation that we're in, in that I hadn't faced even as an environmental activist of several years. Something about being stressed, some part of me wanted my head in the sand, some part of me was just enjoying the, the, the nice weather we've been having in the UK. And so the first thing I'm wanting to do today is to really ask us to face this squarely in the face, to look into this abyss that humanity finds itself at. Life on Earth is dying. 400,000 deaths of people annually. And those with the least responsibility for this have suffered the most. Our families in Bangladesh, in Varanatu, in the Philippines. Because we haven't tackled the extractivism that we've imposed on countries in the global south, because we haven't tackled those injustices, that injustice is now coming home to our children who are not protesting when they're leaving school. In my view, they're begging for their future, they're begging for their lives. So whilst mainstream science and mainstream bodies are very much sounding the alarms, they are, they are still unfortunately conservative. This paper, What Lies Beneath, was about the understatement of existential climate risk. I won't get into the details, but essentially, IPCC models don't include tipping points and feedback loops. And Professor Shellnuber was led to say that climate change is now reaching the end game. The issue is the very survival of our civilization. Another credible commentator, Jem Benzel, whose paper on deep adaptation has been downloaded over 450,000 times, in his estimation, says that social collapse is coming, it's inevitable, and it's soon, not everybody agrees with that, but it's a, it's a viewpoint, that immense catastrophe, massive loss of life is very likely, and that human extinction is possible. David Wallace Wells makes clear in his book why this Civilization is finished because when economic growth falls by 1% uh, for every degree of warming and we're saying that we're heading for at least 3, 3.2 and probably more, then you can see that economic collapse is on its way, probably triggered beforehand by food shortages. The academic term is multi-breadbasket failure. We already had Lithuania last year in a state of emergency due to crop production and Latvia call its harvest a national disaster. When food prices spike, when food production collapses, you get into the possibility of fascism, and the 13 indicators of fascism are already in the room. And as people accept that we have an emergency, we have two very clear choices. We are at a, at a choice point. Do we want more democracy, or do we want less? Because this democracy is not working for us. In my view, it's a fake democracy. Well, we're in a technology conference, and one of the main things I want to say here, that this crisis is founded in ecology more than physics, and I speak with, as a person with a background in molecular biophysics. The Earth is alive, it's interconnected, your body is not a single body, you've got a kilogram of organisms living in your body that keeps you alive. If you can close down your left brain, as I did one time with uh, psychedelic drugs, your right brain will ha tell you what the reality is, that you're interconnected and at one with the whole universe. There are no boundaries. We live in a paradigm that sees an ascendancy of the left brain that focuses on reductionism, the idea that carbon atoms are somehow the problem that we're facing. The, this paradigm we live in is about scarcity, separation, and powerlessness. Well, while I think technology might have a role as we walk forwards, as here, I think we need to really focus on the fact that it is an ecological crisis. You can be in this conference with all this technology getting a bit of a hard-on about it, but this is not going to solve this crisis right. We're in a biological annihilation. 
One in four mammals are set to die, one in eight birds, a third of all amphibians, 70% of the world's plants. They talk about the insect apocalypse, a 75% decline in insect species, one in five British mammals to be extinct within a decade, a million species at risk of extinction according to the recent IPBES uh, report. Wildlife is being destroyed by habitat destruction, overhunting, pollution, invasion by ex alien species, and also climate change, but it's not just climate change. The ultimate cause, the authors say, is overpopulation, and more than that, it's overconsumption, especially by the rich. This idea we can keep having economic growth, these global goals that all look great with economic growth stuck in the middle of it, don't make any sense to me. We have to degrowth the economies of the West, and in fact, fairness allow the economies of other countries to grow. And here's a sobering fact, you know, of all the animals on the world, in the world, 60% are livestock for food, 36% are humans and only 4% of them are wild animals. We've got other ecological pressures, ocean acidification to double by 2100, pollution of the air, soil and water from particulates, plastics, chemicals, water depletion. Well, you can look at that map and think, oh, we'll be all right, but that's where your food comes from. Soil erosion in the UK, Michael Gove said, we're 30 to 40 years away from a fundamental loss of fertility deforestation and habitat loss. Can you look at that picture of the uh, orangutan? And I know I stuff my face with palm oil infused products at time when I'm feeling a bit down. And this is what it's about. But this is also what it's about, looking at the orangutan taking a bit of direct action there with the, uh, with the digger. So there have been uh, five other extinctions. This is the sixth one. They've all had carbon dioxide implicated. The Permian-Triassic extinction was runaway climate change, which caused methane releases, and we're seeing the melting of the methane clath rates. We know the mechanism that could see 97% of all life on Earth wiped out. A, a, a paper that doesn't actually look at biodiversity loss, just the climate threat, said there's a 1 in 20 chance of... Um, effects that are beyond catastrophic. It's like putting your children on a plane that has a 1 in 20 chance of coming down, the authors said. So what does it mean to look at this truth? For me, it meant a feeling of a dark night of the soul over many weeks, a grief. I expect to die. I expect that my children will die, but that all life on Earth will die. How are we to live in these times? How are we to stand up and talk about business opportunities and business as usual? We have to tell each other the truth. In, in, in the way we say it in Extinction Rebellion, we're fucked. We are fucked. Humanity is fucked. It's a disaster, folks, of biblical proportion. And we have to allow in that feeling of grief. This is a feminine piece for all of us, men and women and other uh, genders, to feel the grief. Because when you feel grief, you feel love. And when you feel love, you can feel courage. And let's take courage in the fact that the solutions to this crisis, which is multiple, are about re-loving nature, rewilding, regenerating, reducing what we do, being together. But in order to see these solutions come forwards, we're going to need to rebel. And we've started that with the Extinction Rebellion. So civil disobedience is essential right now. There's a whole social change literature about it if we want to birth change. The social contract is broken. I'm not organizing protests. I'm organizing a rebellion against my government. What we did in London recently was Occupy London in five locations over 11 days. Over 1,000 people were arrested. There are about 130 groups across the UK, but they're springing up all the time. 339 groups across the world in 58 countries. We pulled up a massive pink vagina, a big boat in the middle of Oxford Circus with the name of Bertha Caceres on it. She's an environmental activist that died fighting for her land. So if you think some of us are brave being arrested in the UK, we're simply using the privilege we have here. 47 environmental activists die across the world each year. 
Well, we were criticized for causing disruption as if we'd achieved nothing. But in this graph, you can see on the right-hand side what happened through the autumn during the various protests, including Fridays for the Futures, Greta Thunberg's piece, and then what happens with the Extinction Rebellion protests in London. And this is a Banksy that appeared at Marble Arch. Marble Arch was beautiful, and all the locations were beautiful. I hung out with people that I'd never met, and we had the time of our lives talking and feeling really connected and empowered, and how abundant it felt to eat vegan food from a kitchen we'd knocked up in the middle of a road that was supposed to have traffic running through it. Who needs to fly to Ibiza and have a burger when you've had experiences like that? I think our experience that we want to have as Extinction Rebellion is about prefiguring the human scale changes that are needed. We are facing a crisis, but we need to do this together. We need to be together through that crisis. The soil, the oceans, and plant life, the biodiversity, these are the carbon sucking machines that I'm choosing. And so in that way, you know, as Greta Thunberg says, you only talk about moving forwards with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess. Let's not, you know, as we go in rounds here, wanking over technology solutions and uh, talking about things that probably mean massive extraction of more resources and more ripping off the global south. That's a process that's looking like death by a thousand cuts. This is about the rise in feminine, the reunification of all of us coming together, coming together, enjoying ourselves, you know, acting as if the truth is real. So join the rebellion, is what I'm asking you to do. And let's all be lovers. This is not our mother earth. This is our lover earth. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but I would absolutely hate the job of following on from that. So can we give a big round of applause to Fabrice Bolio, the EVP of Marketing, R&D, Digital and Sustainability at Reckitt Ben Kieser. Uh, you've got a tough job on your hands. Off you go. Thank you. Why do we go to work every day? Why do you get up in the morning? Is it money? What you learn? Lovely colleagues? Maybe all three? My name is Fabrice Beaulieu. I'm uh, the CMO of Reckitt Bankiser RB Hygienome. What gets me up in the morning is the amazing impact that our brands can have on millions of lives everywhere in the world. That's what I'm here to talk about today. At RB, we sell consumer goods, 14 million per day, in more than 150 countries. Our company vision is to create a cleaner world. You probably know our brands. You use them, maybe. You love them, hopefully. They do various things. Mortine repels insects. Vanish removes stains. Harpic is a toilet cleaning brand. And Finish cleans dishes in a dishwasher. And by now, inevitably, some of you must be thinking, is this guy on the wrong stage? <laughs> is this guy on the wrong stage? Climate dishwasher. Oh, really? Let me give you a few insights, facts, around dishwashing. This is a load of dirty dishes. A few of them doesn't look particularly easy. Looks rather greasy. So let's put them in the dishwasher, press the button, forget about it. That will use water. Actually, how much water 
do you think that will consume? Just think about it for a second. Maybe picture a number in your head. How much water will it require to clean that load of dishes? 10 liters. Again, some of you must be thinking, wow, 10 liters, that's huge. At every load, every time, I do this all the time. Fine, let's take the same dishes, put them in the sink, clean them by hand. How much water will that consume? Think about it. Picture another number, maybe the same number. Maybe a lot less, maybe a little more. 100 liters. 100 liters of water every time you clean these dishes by hand. That's because of this. The tap keeps running all the time when you clean them by hand. Whilst in the dishwasher, it's the same water which gets used and reused over and over through a smart system of cleaning and filtering that water. So let's do what probably all of us have done at least once in our life. Let's take these dishes, place them under the tap, rinse them off, put them in the dishwasher. Well, that's still 60 liters. 10, 60, 100. That quickly adds up, doesn't it? That's still only one load. Multiply now by the billions of people who do that every day. And now we are coming to the connection with impact with the effect of climate change. Climate change drives water scarcity. According to the UN, more than 2 billion people live right now in countries experiencing high levels of water stress. Last year, South Africa, Cape Town, almost had to turn off the taps to the houses of its inhabitants. That day, was closely averted. It was named Day Zero, the day without water. But the threat of Day Zero is still here. 14 out of the 20 largest mega cities in the world face right now the threat of water stress. One of these mega cities is Istanbul in Turkey. So have a look at what we've started to talk about in Turkey. Türkiye, yakın gelecekte su fakiri olma tehlikesiyle karşı karşıya. Oysa biz bulaşıkları sudan geçirdikçe her yıkamada 57 litre suyu israf ediyoruz. Bu alışkanlıktan vazgeçelim. Yarınlarımız için. Çocuklarımız için. Hadi söz verin. Birlikte her sene bir gör dolusu suyu kurtaralım. Biz bulaşıklarınızı sudan geçirmeden tertemiz yapacağımıza söz veririz. Türkiye'nin ilki en sevilen. Finish. We tell simple facts. We try and change simple daily habits. And we know, obviously, that uh, the challenge of water scarcity goes far beyond consumer usage. But consumer usage is uh, where we have expertise. That's where we feel we have a responsibility to do more than we've done, to do more than just sell products. We care about climate, we care about water, we care about people, quite simply. And some of our brands have been caring for a very, very long time. You know Harpik, probably. Harpik will turn 100 years old next year. You know it as a toilet cleaner. 
But it's so much more than that. To have access to a toilet is a basic human right. I'm sure we all agree on that. A basic human right. Yet one person out of three in the world right now don't have access to a toilet. To Harpik, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable that so many people today would be deprived from the dignity and very often from the safety that toilet access provides. It's not acceptable that there would be on this planet more people with a phone than with a toilet. So have a look at one of the things that Harpik does to change that. The bog, the dummy, the loo, the restroom, the urinal, the kazi, the powder room, the toilet. Whatever you call it, we all have one. Wrong. Despite the fact we spend almost 92 days of our lifetime in the toilet, one in three worldwide don't have access to one at all. This disproportionately affects women and young girls who often spend hours finding somewhere safe to go. They not only lack privacy, but are also exposed to diseases, violence, and prevented from bettering their lives through education. For many, the toilet is actually a safeguard for their future. It offers safety, privacy, and education. It's more than a toilet. Together with Water.org and Harpic, we wanted to create a campaign that raised awareness of this crisis. To kick things off, we didn't just tell people about the toilet crisis. We let them experience it for themselves. Hey, are you back to the toilet? I'm afraid you can't. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, I can't let you in. What is this some sort of joke? I get really, really angry. It's our basic human right. Women are at risk of attack. I ain't got clue it's about. People can get sick and end up in a hospital. Some people die. What? There's another toilet a couple of miles that way. Miles? It's ludicrous, because I'm going to wee myself right on the floor if you don't let me go. This became our hero asset of the campaign. We then took the stunt to worldwide social impact conferences. All the toilets in the building are out of order. We created bespoke cubicles and shared messages online. People even started to join in. We got over 81 million views. Exposure in over 132 countries over 230 million impressions and drove over 290,000 to the water.org site. By creating awareness through this campaign, we broke the silence on the global sanitation crisis, an issue that for far too long had been ignored. Harpik, Finnish, these are two examples. And we have many more. Um, we will have many, many more because we are very systematic about this, extremely systematic. For um, every one of our brand, we define thoroughly what we want the brand to care about. We articulate very precisely what we want the brand to care so much about that it will drive all of its actions. We call it the brand purpose, and that brand purpose should connect directly to our products, to our science, because it should be real, it should be genuine, it should be actionable. All of our brands select an SDG, one where we think we can have some impact. And then all of our brands embrace a social cause so that we walk our own talk. Toilet access, water conservation. Ours are humble contributions. We know that in the face of problem of a huge magnitude. But they are not intentions, they are actions. And here in this conference, I've been able in the last two days to measure concretely how technology, the amazing talents that you meet, all kinds of very new solutions can bring these, in, these actions, these programs, on steroids, really. Consumers demand it. Consumers want corporates to do more. They demand that brands serve, not just sell. And to conclude, 
Let me tell you that this sort of work is good for the people who help, we help. It's good for business. It gives you a very, very different reason to get up in the morning. It gives you a very different reason to come to work every day. So if you want to join us in the journey, if you have the same passion to help as we do, if you want to help us create a cleaner world, please reach out, join us. Thank you. Okay, very big thank you to Fabrice. And finally, we have a wonderful fireside. Can I welcome to the stage our moderator, Helia Ebrahimi, economics correspondent at Channel 4 News, and her guest. That's not her entrance music. Not usually, anyway. If you see her at lunch, it won't be like, resonating around her. And her guest, uh, Edgar Bronfman Jr., the chair of Global Thermostat and Seagram Universal. Thank you very much, guys. We had this incredibly powerful presentation from Gail about the risk that climate change poses to civilization. So perhaps to avert the crisis, we need to do more than just reduce our emissions. Step forward, companies like Edgar's Global Thermostat, who are pioneering technologies that take carbon dioxide directly from the air. So I guess the question is, is direct air capture, is it plausible? Is it scalable? And, and how does it work? Just take us through why the technology at Global Thermostat is a game changer. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Um, first of all, Gail said to me, I wouldn't want to follow me if I were you. Um, and I, I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, but I actually don't, I, I agree with everything that Gail said. Uh, up there, and, and I don't think anything that we're doing, I think, is supportive of that. The most important thing, I think, to recognize is how significant a crisis we face. I don't even like the word climate change because change is a, is a gradual thing. This is a climate crisis. It's a climate emergency, and we're not behaving as if it is. Uh, but in order to avert five degrees potentially even three degrees, but certainly um, uh, to avert five degrees, in addition to reducing emissions, however that's done, whenever it's done, we'll still need to take CO2 out of the air. There, there's simply no way to reduce emissions quickly enough without the help of actual CO2 reductions in the atmosphere. Um, rem remember, and with, the, with the Fabrice's uh, presentation, you saw how many people in the world are without a toilet. Well, think about that half of the world, before the end of the, by the end of the 20th century, only half of the world was powered. Now, almost all of the world is powered. And much of that incremental power is coming from coal, it's coming from diesel, it's coming from oil, and it's coming from natural gas. So the increase in CO2 emissions is, is very real, uh, and while countries have their own borders, we all share the atmosphere. Um, and so what we've done at Global Thermostat is to try and create a business that therefore can attract enough scale, enough capital to scale to try and meet this problem. And wh why is it, I mean, w we've heard about carbon capture for years. There's been a lot of criticism about carbon capture, about whether it actually captures the carbon. How is air capture, direct air capture, different? Yeah, so uh, direct air capture just removes CO2 from the air, a little bit like a dehumidifier removes water uh, from, from, from the air. Um, and what we do with it, uh, you know, is different for lots of, of people. But at the, at the end of the day, I think there are fundamentally two things that uh, w taking CO2 out of the air does. It, ma it makes CO2 available, which, by the way, there's very little CO2 available for industry, which is a remarkable thing since there's so much of it in the atmosphere. So whatever you can make from carbon from the ground, you can make from carbon from the air. Carbon is carbon. So there is a whole rethinking of industry around what can be made from carbon from the air. 
whether you can put CO2 into concrete to strengthen concrete, you can replace steel with carbon fiber, you can make plastic uh, from car uh, carbon from the air rather than from the ground, you can increase CO2 for agriculture, et cetera, and you can also take CO2 out of the air and simply put it back in the ground where it, it came from. And how, how is this, you know, to borrow a phrase, Gail, how is this not just wanking to technology? I mean, what, what, what is the industry shift? What, are, what is the ethics behind what you're doing? And, and, and will it make a difference? Yeah, so I think what we're doing couldn't happen without people like Gail, uh, which um, creates the, the, no pun intended, the energy uh, for people to start paying attention to climate change. And we're, we're just one part uh, of, of the solution, but we, no one would pay attention to us if it weren't for people like Gail calling this in, in a crisis. But it is important to remember uh, the scale of what needs to be done. So the IPCC, and by the way, I, I think their, their predictions are way too optimistic, frankly, in terms of CO2 reduction. But under these incredibly optimistic um, uh, scenarios, w to keep us under about two and a half degree uh, warming, we need to be taking a billion tons of CO2 out of the air by 2030. Okay, 2030. That's tomorrow. <coughs> and in fact, that those CO2 declines will not, will not come that quickly. So we'll probably need to be taking two or three billion tons out by 2030. Now, I just want to say, since we get used to these numbers so easily, a million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 32 years. So it's a lot more. Uh, and, and in order to scale to that level, you need capital, uh, you, you, you need, uh, you, you know, you'll, you'll need technology. My goal is not to judge um, other companies or other countries that are trying to p power their, their, um, their economies and their people and get them toilets and refrigeration, et cetera. My goal is to try and reduce concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Full stop. That's what what's what global thermostat can do. And, and talk to us about the the kind of investment cycle and what your company's been through, and 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 what you can do on a scalable in a scalable sense. I mean, how much could you take out of the air, and and where do you see that going over the next five years? So, um, it's been a ten-year journey to get this technology to work at a. At a, at a cost where it's, it can be profitable. Getting CO2 out of the air is actually not a new thing. The Germans figured out how to do that uh, in order that soldiers would survive in submarines, um, but it's obviously a very expensive uh, system. So to do it at scale and at low cost is a real trick uh, because for every ton of CO2 that you uh, take out of the air, you have to move 3,000 tons of air. Uh, and, and so to do that and make it economic is very, very difficult. Um, but, but we've done that. We've just signed a contract with one of the world's largest energy companies. We're close to signing contracts with other major companies um, that can scale this uh, and will scale this with us. Uh, and again, I think we, we have to do everything we can societally to reduce emissions. Uh, but even if we do that, we still face a crisis, and we're going to have to get CO2 uh, uh, concentrations down before it gets significantly worse, and it's pretty bad right now. And it, you, we've had investors in this space, people like Bill Gates investing in this industry, uh, miners like BHP Billiton investing in this industry. What makes uh, Global Thermostat's technology different or unique? So the first thing, and this is also to a point Gail made, the first thing is that 80% of the energy that we require to run our machines is waste heat. So it's heat that doesn't even boil water, which is otherwise vented into the atmosphere. So we actually only use 20% of our, of our energy needs are incremental, and 80% of them use waste heat. So we are by far the most carbon negative of the solutions out there, there are three of them. By the way, they're all necessary, and this is not a winner-take-all. Um, but that's one, one key issue. So we, we use less energy, we pay less for the energy that we use, um, and therefore we can be competitive with cost. It also our capital costs are much lower. So that industries can adopt 
transforming their processes from receiving carbon from the ground into carbon And, and is the, the take up to that? I mean, is there a shift? You were talking about Extinction Rebellion being part of the shift in culture and understanding. Is, th is there a difference in companies, not just Reckitt Benkiza, who, who want to do things differently? Yes, and I think it comes, uh, and w with no disrespect to, to, to Reckitt, it, I'm sure it comes from the core and soul of the company, but it is energized for sure by the, by the, 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 the demonstrations and the, criti the criticism of consumers. And um, companies really are now looking at their sort of license to operate. And, and they will be turned away by consumers if they're not seen to be doing uh, something for, for the environment. So this, there has been a sea change in the last six months. I mean, I've spent nearly 10 years banging my head against a brick wall uh, trying to get big companies to pay attention to this technology. And now, all of a sudden, the, the tide has shifted. All the doors are open. Well, they're opening, sudden. that's for sure. And, and movements like Gail's is, is a huge part of what is opening those doors. Uh, but the truth is, is that in opening those doors, we've got to find every solution that's possible to reduce CO2 uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. And what I worry about sometimes is that we allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know, some people criticize this technology because it allows um, oil-fired furnaces to, to continue well, well, to operate. Th that's the argument, right? Is, is that is any kind of carbon capture just an excuse for companies and industry airlines to just go on emitting or not take seriously. You talked about it as a climate crisis um, and, and whether, whether what you're doing inadvertently creates a safety net for, for, for politicians and for industry to get away from what they should be doing at their core, which is fundamentally moving away from fossil fuels. Yeah, so I, I think the answer is that might be true. Um, it's probably not true, and I'll explain why. But we don't have time to have that conversation. Um, that's the problem. If this were 25 or 30 years ago, we would have time. We don't have the time. We've got to get CO2 out of the atmosphere. We also have to recognize that, uh, as Gail said, the West, or the developed world, has sucked up so much uh, of the resources and polluted th the atmosphere, and now it's somebody else's turn to develop their own countries and to tell them that they cannot turn to the world's cheapest source of, of, uh, of energy to do that, who are, who are we to, to tell them that? So if, if our technology were to allow a country to do something it otherwise wasn't going to do, I understand the argument, but you've got to assume that if, we didn't, if our technology didn't exist, a, com a country that's currently using coal would then automatically switch because our technology didn't exist to solar? I, I, I don't see that. And I frankly, again, we don't have the time. The world has to move to a renewable uh, system. It needs to move to solar, it needs to move to wind. But the truth is it can't move there that quickly, quickly enough for us to avoid catastrophic outcomes, particularly to the poor of the world. And I, I was telling Gail, and, and I, I mean this, part of what I wanna do is prove that capitalism can be a, a source for good because if capitalism only works for 5% of the world, it doesn't deserve to exist. It will be taken away, it will go away. So it's either gonna rise up and start solving some of the world's greatest challenges, or there'll be catastrophic chaos and some other system will eventually emerge. But any system that leaves out the vast majority of humanity from progress cannot survive and doesn't deserve to. And, and do you think that you were talking about, you've spent a decade, you know, banging your head against the wall, trying to get corporates to listen to you, uh, and there seems to be an opportunity now. How do you build on that momentum? How do you make sure the door stays open and companies and governments follow through on their pledges? Well, I think, frankly, the pressure needs to remain on, and groups like Extension, Extinction Rebellion allow that to happen. Shareholders have had a huge impact on companies like Exxon and others where they are refusing to invest in companies that you know. Forget about the waste issue, which is 
is obviously a critical issue too. So there are two terrible things about plastic. One is it uses carbon from the ground to be made, and then it sort of sits in our oceans and whatever. So um, ultimately, the polymer manufacturers will be under pressure to use CO2 from the air. The problem is that up till now, there's there's no been no CO2 available. So this allows us to transform whatever of the carbon economy to at least closing the carbon cycle and taking out of the uh, air what we've what we've put there. Uh, in this country, there's been a lot of criticism uh, of the government in the last decade for abandoning their green policies, being inconsistent, rolling back, not being clear. Industry's been calling out for more definitive goals from government. Do you, do you think that this major shift, this sea change that we're seeing, does th can that be led just by consumers and stakeholders? Or would you like to see governments act more, do more? And, and what does that mean in, in countries like the US when you've got a president like Donald Trump? So I think, I think mostly all government action starts with consumer pressure, um, certainly democracies. And again, I don't want to get into good democracy, bad democracy. But if the governments that we now have are going to act, it's going to be because the voters tell them that they must act. And there's no question that putting a price on carbon would be a great thing. It would also move money to poorer countries. Because if you think of a company like Exxon that is using way too much CO2, they could pay a country like Rwanda that's using less CO2 to allow them to continue. And so you actually start moving dollars away from the West to, to, to poorer countries. That certainly would help because the more carbon costs a company, the less they're going to use it, right? So, th so, so that definitely um, will help. So you don't worry that that encourages companies to go on again, continuing bad practices. My my view is that when when the U.S. government told the car manufacturers they had to increase miles per gallon, they did it. Until then, they refused to do it. Is it the perfect answer? No. Okay, we shouldn't use gasoline, but you know, perfect doesn't always exist, and, and good is better than bad, and so on that continuum. And the scale of what we need to do is so immense that looking for perfect is a, is a problem. I, I will say, as far as governments are concerned, uh, and this is a very controversial comment, but I, th I don't know that there's a legal case uh, for governments to be charged with criminal negligence, but I think there should be, because what, what, what Gail was talking about, 400,000 deaths, th that number is going to increase, and it's going to increase dramatically. And if you refuse to acknowledge science because you, you choose to have a different view, th I, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to, and, and the consumers, we're not allowed to, to behave like that, right? If, if I just decide something isn't true and I behave as if it isn't true and, you know, and harm someone as a result, I'm, I'm responsible. How, how do you then kind of fix in your mind a, a, a moment now that you said there's a sea change of attitude with consumers, with companies, and with a president like Donald Trump who comes to this country and says climate change, well, it goes up and it goes down. I mean, how, how do you wrap your head around that, and how, how do you battle against that? Well, I, I mean, you're not going to change Mr. Trump. Um, so uh, I'm not going to worry about that. I think the only thing we, we, we must do... Is that not a big obstacle, though? Well, we need to replace them. Um, and, and, and it is a big obstacle, and it's why I, I, I bring up the criminal negligence, because the U.S., frankly, more than anyone, um, can lead a global effort for... A, a, in, in a, and if it fails to do that, it will have tremendous repercussions on the whole world, not just the U.S. I, I do think that there is a... You know, back in World War II, the military-industrial complex was created, and that the machinery that it ultimately built defeated Nazi Germany. I, I, I do think that um, there needs to be an environmental-industrial complex built to take on the next huge challenge to humanity, and in so doing, I think we can we can we can create new economies, we can create new jobs. Uh, one of the problems with climate change or climate crisis, climate emergency, 
is that we, we talk about it in ways where people have to stop doing things. They, they can't, they don't, shouldn't drive this car and they should drive that car and they shouldn't use less water. And, and of course they should do all those things, but it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough message to people. That, uh, and so in addition to doing all those things, we really need to go to industry uh, and get industry to change. And frankly, that's hard to do without consumer action, government action, and uh, profitable, low-cost solutions in which they can invest. And, and just on that final point, profitable, low-cost solutions, is, is, are people seeing this as financial opportunity as well? What's the view from investors when they're looking at this space? So, you know, to take a billion tons of CO2 out of the air, we probably need capital of around $200 billion. So it's about $200 a ton capital. That's actually very low, but it's still $200 billion. And how are you going to get $200 billion? From whom? The, 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 the answer is, if it's not profitable, you can't raise that capital. And, and so we're in that conundrum of, well, anything profitable is bad. Well, I, I hope that we can prove that something profitable can, can be good and that capitalism can be good. But the truth is, if you need $200 billion to take a billion tons of CO2 out of the world, we got to raise it. We've got to get it, and the only way we're going to do that, short of governments putting up the money for no return, which I think is a fool's errand, quite honestly, and by the time they do it, it will be way too late, we have to find a profitable means so that we can get that investment, we can create that scale, and we can help reduce CO2 uh, concentrations. And in terms of direct air capture, what, what's the pathway forward for what this technology can achieve in the next five to ten years? So, for instance, where are you now, and where are you going to so be? So we're building. So we're, we, we, it's a sca very scalable solution. We have different uh, sizes of modules. Let's say the largest one is fifty thousand tons per year. It's very little, um, but still, we think it's the most efficient large model for direct air capture. We also do point source capture. Uh, but in terms of... What's the difference between... So direct air capture is taking it just out of the air. Point source is, is taking the, the CO2 stream th uh, from, a, from an emitter. Th the problem is there's no infrastructure to transport CO2. So if you take it from the emitter, which we're happy to do, what you do with it is a problem. Um, but just to say that there's one company that's asked us to give them nearly 3 million tons of CO2 in one place in uh, South America impossible uh, uh, without direct air capture. That CO2 doesn't exist. It's not obtainable any other way. They're going to combine that with hydrogen that they're going to separate from water, um, and they're going to create synthetic fuel. And when you combine CO2 and hydrogen, you get gasoline. And that gasoline is exactly the same gasoline that you're currently driving, requires no, no change in the cars or the infrastructure, but it's, it's just sourced differently. It's sourced from above the ground rather than below the ground. Now, again, does that, is, is, is that perfect? No. Is it better than what we're doing now? Yes. Will planes one day fly on solar fuel cells? Probably. Is that going to be in the next 30 years? Not a chance. And, and is there a risk, though, that you delay the electrification of cars if you have this intermediate solution? I, 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 I don't see it. Uh, and, and, and I don't see it at all. And frankly, it's kind of all hands on deck. Um, we have to get CO2 concentrations down. And we have to find every means, whether that's you know, hu human behavior changes, government regulation changes, industry uh, adopting new technologies, et cetera. We really don't have the time to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, and uh, you know, I see this as a transitional technology. I think it'll be relevant for maybe 50 or 75 years, and then hopefully we'll be in a renewable uh, economy, and you won't need to take more CO2 out of the air. But if we don't take CO2 out of the air, uh, this world is going to be very different and probably largely uninhabitable for large parts of the planet. Uh, you know, we're, we're very close right now to parts of the Middle East being uninhabitable for some months per year. Because as humidity rises and temperatures rise, there is a point at which humans can't survive outside for more than five or 10 minutes. We're not very far away from that. Um, and the people who cannot move to safer areas, of course, are the poor. 
uh, and the sick and, and the otherwise disadvantaged. So, you know, it is a horror what we're doing and what we're allowing to happen. And it's our responsibility to change that and find solutions. Ours is a part, it's certainly not a silver bullet. There's not one silver bullet. But, you know, we, we think it's a, we, we think we can help and we intend to do that. What, what's the biggest challenge then? It's not, it's not a silver bullet, but you see your uh, place within trying to find some solutions, some very real solutions. What's the biggest challenge that your industry or, or global thermostat particularly faces? It'll be industry adoption uh, and, and, and government n knowledge. So I, I think there currently are subsidies that allow us to take CO2 out of the air and bury it back in the earth. Um, those subsidies need to broaden. They don't necessarily need to increase, but they need to broaden so that we can start getting CO2 out of the air that way. And then industries need to adopt processes so that they are, they are using carbon from the air rather than from the ground to, you know, carbon is, is the source of life, right? We're not, we're not going to get into a carbon-free world. The question is how do we manage that and how, and how can we do that? And companies react to consumers. So it starts with people like Gail. It really does. That's what changes the world. We all We're need to rebel. We all do need to rebel. All, all, all we are is, you know, one one item on an a la carte menu. Uh, but Gail's got to get us into the restaurant. Um, and, and and tell me, going forward, I mean, in this country, uh, there's a lot of criticism that uh, Brexit has kind of swallowed the oxygen of any kind of policy changes. Are there countries that are doing better in terms of moving the agenda forward? Would you point to a government that is doing a good job? I, I think probably Norway um, is is really working uh, on this. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, again, countries have borders. The atmosphere does not. So... If one country does something wonderful, that's great, but it doesn't solve the problem for that country, right? Because that country still is sharing the world's atmosphere, and so if other countries are not behaving in the same way, you know, it's a it's a it's a small, uh, it's an incremental improvement. By the way, every incremental improvement is important, um, but uh, I would say very few governments are. Uh, are doing the right thing, and that is because they're very short-term oriented, they want to win the next election, and their view is climate change is a, is a loser uh, at the ballot box because people fear it'll take away their jobs or lower their incomes, et cetera. But people under the age of 30 or 35 do not see it as a loser, and I think you will see it being one of the most important uh, issues that any Democrat will talk about in the 2020 elections in the U.S., because if the young people in America come out and vote, Donald Trump will lose. And if they don't come out and vote, he has a much better chance of winning re-election. And the thing that will motivate young people more than any other subject, according to every poll that anybody has ever conducted uh, on both sides of the aisle, is environment. And just a final thought, uh, the message to the audience in this room, if they want to get involved in, in the industry of g tackling climate change, what, what one piece of advice would you give them? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is I don't think anyone has properly priced in climate to their portfolio management and to their investment strategy. Um, there are whole industries that are going to be at much greater risk as a result of climate change. People haven't priced that in. People haven't priced that into the insurance companies. You know, um, REITs uh, are investing in Florida, in southern Florida, which is likely to get flooded very soon. You ask them why they're doing it, they say, because we have insurance. You go to the insurance companies, they say, oh, yeah, but it's only for one year. Um, so that, that whole system, people need to, to be careful. And then if and when you see uh, companies or technologies that can promote a better planet, Invest there and take your money away from companies or, or industries that don't see the light. Thank you so much, Dave Romfren. Thank you very much. Thank you.